Good afternoon, everybody. Today I wanted to talk about sunspots and how they affect the climate on our planet. And it seems through the information presented over the last couple of years into the sunspot and the solar cycles that we are going to enter a cool phase for the next 30 years or so. Now, solar cycles in the study of the sun are nothing new. We've been looking at the sun and the solar cycles and the sunspots, recording those since the early 1600s. That's about 400 years of data. So if cycles would repeat themselves, a 400 year window is a good amount of time where we can look in and see if cycles do repeat themselves. Now a solar cycle is nothing more than where the sun has maximum output of activity. And you'll notice this with the abundance of solar spots on the disk. And these run in 11 year cycles. And each cycle, there'll be a maximum and a minimum. When it does come down to the minimum, there'll be an absence of sunspots and it should look something blank like the sun does on the right side of this picture here. Now, when we start talking about solar cycles and sunspot numbers, let's take a look. They numbered them from one at the earliest into number 24, where we are now. Sunspot observations have actually extended backward into 1600, but the official counting of solar cycle number one, number two, number three, didn't kick off until approximately 1740 or so. The reason I show you that is, here's our current solar cycle up in 2015, 2014, we're at solar cycle 24. Notice the active regions, the maximum sunspot count in solar cycle 22 was around 350. It dropped a bit down to 250 for solar cycle 23, and now we're down to 150 maximum for solar cycle 24, and if we continue the trend line, you'll notice that the drop should continue and we will probably be around 50 coming up for our next solar cycle 25. And again, the intensity after there's a rebound going back up to maximum, solar cycle 22 is pretty much the way it has been for quite a, a long time now, over 100 years. It's minimum, and then it shoots straight back out into our maximum activity. Notice solar cycle 24, it's a very gradual increase out of there at the bottom graph. Again, the trend line is downward. We go from Maximum sunspots. If you, this is sort of a smooth scale here. Instead of taking the absolute maximum of the sunspot cycle, this is sort of a smooth scale where it takes the average through the center of this. So the average for solar cycle 22 would have been around, let's say, 160, and then solar cycle 23 would have been around 120. We're kind of solar cycle 24 right around 80. This is going to decrease to around 60 or 50. And solar cycle 25. Again, let's jump back in time. This is a smooth sunspot count. Again, taking the average from 1750 all the way until 2011, but this is actually even a tiny bit lower through 2013 and 14. But notice the trend line on here. That number from 2007 to 2011 has actually dropped. It has not peaked above that line. So we're starting to mimic the same conditions of 1907. And if we go further back into the Dalton minimum, is kind of where we are heading in 1807 to 1825. Now, what is the Dalton minimum? Well, Dalton minimum was a period of low solar activity, late 1700s, early 1800s, and it dropped the global temperature about one degree Celsius. That did have an effect on plant and crop production throughout the world. Now, when we look at cycles and repeating cycles, a lot of ancient cultures believed that there was repeating cycles of time. We just were in a cycle and then it repeated itself. In the West currently, in our new science, we believe it's linear. It starts at one, it goes to a thousand, there's no cycle repeated. Ancient cultures believed it went one to a hundred and then started over again and repeated. Well, here's a repeating cycle. If we look at solar cycle 22, 23, 24, where we currently are, that's the red line. If we look at solar cycle 3, 4, 5, and 6, that's the blue line. They pretty much match up, except our cycles are a slight bit lower than those last cycles. Again, if you forgot what years those were, solar cycle 3, 4, 5, and 6 ran from 1780 and then ended in 1820, and it came back out to a little bit stronger solar activity, and then the temperature started to warm back up, especially through 1840. Now, those of us that absorb information in a slightly different way, this is a sunspot average data where the sunspot starts on the solar disk itself on the sun's surface on the face if you will wherever it is at which north latitude or which south latitude and how those sunspots gravitated toward the equator notice on the right we have 2014 
but go all the way to the left of the top there and you'll notice that that sunspot butterflies looks very similar to what we have so that's the 1880 seems to be matching up with what we currently have and where we are in the bottom again if you present and absorb information in a different way uh, the trend line that we have for 2014 that black line is a downward trend if we skip all the way to the very left side again we start to see 1880 looking very much the same in the total amount of of spot activity that we have. If we take those cycles further back, we'll notice that in the yellow boxes there, 1815 and also 1618 seem to get around the 50 range, and that's exactly where we're heading here in this next solar cycle 25. If it's on a 200 year window, which it looks like it might be, 1615, 1815, 2015. The reason I, I put 50 as the mark number there is here's where we are. Again, this is a smooth average. If you notice the blue line in the center, it doesn't go for the absolute maximum number for the cycle. It goes through the smooth average center. So solar cycle 23, uh, pretty much around, we'll say 115 would be the smooth average. And then when we come up here to our current solar cycle, we drop down to approximately 75. Our next cycle should take that again and drop down to around 50. Now that magical number 50 is where it seems that solar irradiance seems to be affected in the amount of sunlight and ultraviolet that strikes the planet's surface. If we take a little bit smaller glimpse of time, say a 100-year window, this is what it looks like. You notice it sort of peaked up there from, say, 1920, and then we're back down. I just followed a kind of a sine wave going up and down. Again, there's different information if you want to present it in a bar graph here so you can understand it slightly in a better way. Days that there were no sunspots on the solar disk itself, notice this, in the last 150 years, the top three years have been 2007, 8, and 9. That's interesting itself. And what I mean by that is let's take a visual representation so you have a better idea of what I mean by a spotless day. This is this year in 2014. In July, there were several spots on the sun, although it should have been slightly larger for the activity. But within a couple weeks, it dropped off to almost nothing. There's two small little pinprick solar spots there. Coming along as July 21st, you would think that might have been a one or two day event, but it ended up for, you know, 10 days of almost nothing on the disk. Now this is July 2014. Notice the two pictures here, the right and the left. The left picture shows a lot of sunspots on there the way it should be during a maximum. But a couple of weeks later, in July 17th, that decreased to almost nothing. And look at the size of those spots. They're almost just pinpricks. That might have been an, an anomalous event, I guess, but it, that ran for 10 days in the middle of a solar maximum. And indeed, the, the number of sunspots that came out, the intensity of them, the size of them was really incredibly small, but they still count as a sunspot. And I wish there was somewhere I could find this information where I could find the actual intensity of the spot compared to just the number, because sunspot 2118 counts as a sunspot, but that thing's almost not. That is a pinprick that barely fits the pixelation parameters to be qualified as a sunspot. The intensity and the energy output of that is far lower. A larger swath of time, the 11,000 year time window, let's take a look. It seems to be in a, a downtrend as well. Each cycle seems to be lower. The warming seems to be a little bit less before it plunges back off into a cooler period. You notice it happens in repeated cycles. Now here's the kicker. Cold temperatures, I can put on more coats. Cold temperatures, we can insulate our homes more, not a problem. Now our next graph here shows something that I think is of utmost importance. The amount of total solar irradiance striking our planet per square meter in terms of watts. Now wattage per square meter is often used to decide where you want to install solar panels. Desert areas receive a greater amount of watts per square meter than somewhere in a temperate rainforest. Solar irradiance also has to do with ultraviolet radiation, and that in itself is what prevents blight and mold on our plants, that natural UV. We use UV to kill bacteria and mold in our own processes and factories. The decrease in the solar irradiance is going to take us down into what occurred during the 1800s as well, in the 1600s, crop damage from cold was one factor, yes, but also crop damage because of mold and blight was an entirely different spectrum that was also very common. Lost crops because of a lack of the UV to naturally kill off mold 
And uh, what I'm going to leave you with here is a maunder minimum. It's possible we could go into this, and that would decrease the global temperature two degrees Celsius. Not one like the Dalton minimum, but two. And once we get into that lower, colder temperature, you might want to do a little research on the what they call the little ice age, the mini ice age. Rivers routinely froze over worldwide in the northern hemisphere. And during the maunder minimum, the Native American Indians talked often about how the Everglades in Florida would freeze over for a decade every winter. Now, I'm not into the doom and gloom. I believe there's always solutions to our problems, and I'm not going to give you this information without offering a solution. One solution is going to be we're going to have to start installing greenhouses either in your own home, around your home, connected to your home, something larger scale that a neighborhood or community could share and all work on at the same time. Or as you can see, the technology exists to do something on a massive scale as they have in Almeria, Spain, where they've covered square miles, square kilometers of greenhouses. It's not impossible. The technology definitely exists, although there'll be, you know, some infrastructure input cost there in the first few years before the payback is realized. Now, whichever country installs these first is going to have a leg up because their citizens will have food when it gets a little bit cooler. But then the main question you might want to ask is, if all these countries start installing greenhouses and there's a limited amount of food, who's going to get that food? Who's, who will be left out and who's going to starve? Thanks for watching today. I hope you learned something and look forward to my other videos where I'm going to continue in the series. Uh, with more information backing up by science what I am telling you about the decrease in sunspots and the decrease in temperature on our planet over the next 40 years.